Hello everyone, this is Tahuti Forever from Phoenix, Arizona. I want to thank everybody for tuning in, subscribing to my channel, thumbing up my videos, liking my content. You guys are the reason why I actually do these recordings. So I appreciate you first and foremost, and thank you. Today we're doing a video in reference to a response to Zion Lex. What can I say about this brother? This guy. We're watching your videos. You're out here putting out videos with content from the committed community. So we're watching your videos. So let me first start off by telling you guys how this started. Guys, this all started with an event called Kemet on Trial back in 2013, where the Israelites weren't against the brothers in the Kemetic community on the topic of whether or not the Bible is historical, whether or not the biblical exodus and those things occurred. And everybody know how that turned out. And even I know how that turned out. It didn't turn out well for the Israelites. Came in on trial, that was hot. That was nice. It wasn't organized the way it needed to be organized. I understand you didn't get a chance to get your say. I personally believe they should have definitely let you on there because I'm sure you had a lot to contribute. What was the Hebrew Israelites up there doing? They didn't present anything that, that they needed to present. They up there lollygagging, laughing, making jokes. They made a fool of themselves, they made a fool of you. But what I need you to understand is, even if you got on stage, even if you represented properly, scholarly, the end result would have been the same because you're betting on the wrong horse. You're betting on fiction. You're betting your soul on something that's fictional. And since that day, I have, I've had like this obsession. And those of you who follow me closely, you know what I mean. I had this obsession with Kemet because Brother Jabari and all the rest of the pseudos in the community all tried to say that you know, chattel slavery didn't exist. And that's why y'all can't trust none of these people. Because they full of shit. There you go. There's that bolstering. Can't trust them people. But we're the one giving you the truth. We're the one giving you the history. Here's the thing. Think about this for a second. Think about it for a moment. You go into the ancient comedic primary sources. If you're already acknowledging the truth of the primary sources found in Kemet, you're using those primary sources as fact. But the problem is, is you also try to do that with the Bible. You can't do that with the Bible. You can't use the Bible as a primary source because it's fiction. That's the subject that's on the chopping block. You can't use the Bible as a primary source. You can't trust in the Bible the same way that you can trust in the primary sources found in Kemet. There's no justification in trusting the Bible. One is actual history, the other one is a rewritten story. You're very provocative, boastful, loud. I wish we had 200 more Zion Lexus out here running around learning the Medunetta. Because the bottom line is, if you're believing in the Bible, you're believing in fiction. Jesus fake, bro. If you're believing in the Bible, you're believing in revised history. Now you're calling out our teacher, Jabari Azazi. Now I initiated with Rakasha Shin through the Shrine of Ma'at under Jabari Ozazi. So when I hear you, calling out Jabari Ozaze, I'm like, what is this brother doing? Now, I understand that Jabari is one of the leaders when it comes to signing at a TV, when it comes to debates, when it comes to those type of things. But when you say his name, you got to remember he has a whole squad behind him, right? He has a whole squad behind him. So you can't just call out his name and think that there's not going to be a response. Because I know I can prove that the biblical account of the Exodus is a historical event in history. And I guarantee you, I could prove the Exodus narrative to any grandmaster teacher. 
You say you know how to prove the historicity of the Hebrew Israelites, but you didn't do it in your video. You say you can prove the Exodus. I watched all the evidence that you put forth, but you never once said, here's the Exodus. And you gotta remember, when they wrote the Bible, it was years after the events had happened, so they had already become legend. The whole book is a record of legend. That's what the Bible is. It is not accurate by any means. You said you guarantee that you can prove the biblical narrative. Well, I guarantee that I can prove the exact opposite. You said you guarantee you can prove the biblical narrative, but you didn't do it. Right here and right now, I'm going to prove how the biblical narrative is an absolute work of fiction. He said he want to prove the Bible. When the Bible say the craziest stuff anyone has ever made up, you know it's fake. You know the thing is fake, but there's people out here who time out, I'm going to prove it right, but then just don't do it. This is from HBU Higher Education, okay? Bible Arts and History Museum. All right, so we're talking about people who are Bible believers. They've come up with the genealogy based on biblical scriptures. The calendar over the years have changed. And because the calendars were not set and they were not accurate, the people who wrote the Bible, they decided we're going to use genealogy to give a time frame of these events. Now, when you put this genealogy together, it gives you about 6,000 years from the beginning of the counting system. So Adam, whenever Adam started counting, from that point, biblically speaking, it's been 6,000 years. Reverend James Usher put together a chronology. Now this chronology, hands down, beyond a shadow of a doubt, disproves the biblical narrative. Basically the only way this genealogy could have taken place is if it was on a parallel universe because the history of the earth does not play out in accordance with the biblical narrative. From Adam to Noah, there are 1656 years. These dates are based on scriptures. So if you believe in the Bible, you cannot reject the genealogy. You have to stand by the genealogy. Now I've spoken to some Christians who say the Bible is infallible. But when they look at the actual extrapolation from the genealogy, given us 6,000 years, they want to fight it. Even though every one of these ancestors are in the biblical scripture. So they're contradicting themselves. Either the Bible is infallible, and these people are actually the ages they were when, they, when the Bible describes their age, or the Bible is fallible. There's an idea that God didn't start recording years until after Adam ate the fruit, right? Because it said in that day he would surely die. And basically what Christians are saying is that after he ate the forbidden fruit, that's when he was stricken with the possibility of dying. And that's when time actually had meaning. That's cool. They can have that. But this genealogy makes no difference because what we're doing is we're starting to count from whenever Adam is starting to count or whenever God is starting to count. Whenever the counting system started going forward, anything after that point, the genealogy proves that the biblical narrative is incorrect. Supposedly, Adam was 150 years old when he had Seth. So Seth is the next point that we want to verify. So Adam was 150 years old. Adam is the first man. He's 150 years old. We're at year 150. That's the way this count works. When Enos was born, Seth is 105 years old. Seth is actually a comedic netter, but you see him in the beginning of the Bible. I'm telling Zion, the Bible is a reworked history of comedic theology. You see Seth right there. He's in the genealogy. So keep in mind, there's only been 6,000 years from whenever the counting began. What you do is you add the 105 
with a 150. So you get 255. Sepi gets Enos. Now, Enos lives 90 years before he begets Canaan. Right? So we're at 155 plus 90. I'm not going to go through and cal calculate every single one. It's already been done for us. These ages of these characters, biblical characters, are scripture. Open your Bible. You'll see these words in the Bible. Canaan, 70 years old, begets uh, Michalel. Michalel, uh, 65 years old, begets Jared. Jared, 162 years old, begets Enoch. Enoch, 65 years old, begets Methuselah. Methuselah, you know, so you see how this is going. 187 years old, begets Lemech. 182 years old, begets Noah. There's Noah. Bang. So you calculate all these ages, and you'll see what year Noah was born. Noah, at the coming of the flood, was 600 years old. Bang. All we have to do is go to the flood for me to make my point here. You want to talk about the um, Exodus, <clears throat> but before you get to the Exodus, the biblical narrative has already been destroyed. It says right here, Genesis 5, 5, all together, Adam lived a total of 930 years. Now, when you do this genealogy here, it gives you a grand total, 5,775 years from year one. Now, let's subtract the age of Adam. What happens when you subtract the age of Adam? 4,700 years ago is when Adam died. That's what the biblical narrative is telling you. Well, what year was 4,700 years ago? 2700 BC. Wait a minute. Adam dies in 2700 BC. Well, how was this possible when Kemet was founded in 3100 BC? BC counts down. So 2700 BC is after 3100 BC. What this means is that Adam lived after Kemet or ancient Egypt was founded. It was founded by someone named Narma. Narma had a war and brought together the two lands, Smaitawi. How does that go against the biblical narrative? This is a huge foundational event that happens in the Bible that sets everything else in motion going forward. And that's the flood. So Adam lives all the way through the founding of Egypt. So when did the flood occur? There's no way the flood could have occurred before Adam died because Adam would have died earlier. There's no way the flood happens after Adam dies because Adam lives through the foundation of Kemet. We have records going all the way for 3,000 years. There was no flood in between there where you could have wiped out the uh, Egyptians, the Kemites. Noah would have landed in his ark someplace else and repopulated the planet. That absolutely did not happen in history. Now, the Noah's Ark story comes from the New Ark story, which is a comedic, ancient Egyptian comedic story. Again, Zion. The biblical narrative is a remake of comedic mythology. We need brothers like you to spread the truth. You cannot prove the biblical narrative. As a matter of fact, I just emphatically disproved the biblical narrative. Adam lived to be 930 years old. He lived 300 years after the foundation of ancient Egypt. And Egypt had dynasty after dynasty after dynasty after dynasty. Now here's the thing. Let's say you finagle the numbers. Kemet has records way prior to the foundation of the country. The foundation of the country was not the beginning of the Kemetic people. The Kemetic people go back tens of thousands of years in Nubia. I want to simplify this. We just base it off of Adam. Adam lives 930 years. He lives 300 years into the founding of Kemet. There was no flood. Without the flood, what do you have? That narrative is incorrect. But you've chosen the wrong stallion. You bet on the wrong horse. We're definitely gonna get into what you presented, but when you're using the name of Jabari Ozazi, put some respect on it. Make sure you're giving him the due respect that he deserves. Ashe? Let brother Jabari tell it. Our family, uh, first and foremost family, we, we treated them right, we, we fed them, um, 
uh, we clothed them. They were they were allowed to marry. Of course they gotta be fed, you big dummy. Because we can't enslave you if you're dead. Of course they have to clothe you because the elements will kill you if not. But what's with all this animosity? Why are you speaking with your chest out? Why are you doing all that and then saying Jabari's name? What is that about? Why are you making fun of his voice like that? What is that? And who are you calling a dummy? Really, who are you calling a dummy? You're saying Jabari Ozazi, and then you say they have to do that, you big dummy? That is not okay. We're not just gonna let that slide. That doesn't slide. Now you know this is a hot topic for black people. You know this is a hot topic for black people, so you want to relate the transatlantic slave trade with the type of bondage that they had in Kemet. Not the same thing. Because it's not done by the same type of people. You got melanated people using a form of bondage where people can pay their way out of it. Where their kids are not born into slavery just because their parents were slaves. Where they're allowed to marry. Where they're allowed to purchase lands. This is not the same treatment. You're comparing ancient Kemet to modern day slavery when you're supposed to be comparing the ancient Kemetic system to modern penal system. Where some people can go to prison for life while others can gain their freedom back. So comparing ancient Kemet system to the transatlantic slave trade, you're incorrect. You cannot compare the ancient Kemetic system to the transatlantic slave trade. It will be more correct of you to compare it to the penal system. Why would you want people to believe that it's the same treatment. No one wants their liberties taken. Now I understand that. If that's your point in ancient Kemet, some people's liberties were taken. Some people's freedoms and some people's rights were taken for different reasons. But you cannot compare that to modern slavery. You just can't. This was not a generational thing. This is something that one person did in their life that contributed to them becoming in bondage. One person did that in their own life. If their parents was a slave, the children are still considered free. And don't forget that they can become citizens. If they lost their liberties because they came as conquerors or they were defeated, if they were captives of war, one of the things that they could do is they can gain their citizenship and become on the same levels as the, as the other citizens in Kemet. You didn't have that in modern day slavery. We understand that there were certain things that were happening in Kemet, but let's not relate that to what we call slavery today because it's not the same. A people of Semitic descent and stock, or what is called today Asiatics, by the name of the Hyksos, come into Egypt literally overnight and dispel the Egyptian kings off the throne like you would be plucking a piece of cotton off your garment. Easy. And they reigned over the Egyptians for 200 years. The Egyptians hated the Hyksos so much that they hated all Asiatics on account of the Hyksos. That's how much the people of ancient Kemet hated the Hekas. They say that the Exodus is really a story, a reworked story of the Hyksos leaving Kemet, being expelled by Amos, going into the land of Canaan. Now, keeping in mind that that land at the time was already ruled by Kemet. So they went from one territory of Kemet into another territory of Kemet. The ancestor by the name of Amos that you're talking about that's the actual Moses. That's where the Bible got the concept of Moses. And they really, really, really tweaked that out. It went from Amos gaining his land back from the Hyksos, from the Asiatics. In the Bible, Moses is supposed to gain God's favor. God comes to Moses or Amos or Amosis. God comes to Moses and tells him to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. But that's not what happened in history. That is not what happened. In history, Amos was gaining his land back. Hyksos just means foreign rulers, these Asiatics like you were talking about. They had to go. Of course they had to go, we needed our land back. Later on when the Bible was written, 
how are these people saying that God came down to support them? They had God's favor and they became God's people. Instead of just saying, oh, we lost, we got our butts kicked, they want to claim, oh no, God had a different plan for us. And they wrote this in this book. And you were sitting here sucking this up. Right? Lollipop. You sitting here sucking this up. Now in this video, you're saying that the Exodus occurred after this point. You never give us the actual event of the Exodus. But you want to say that the Exodus was not the Hyksos being expelled back into the land of Canaan. Off top, you've already seen that the story is reworked. There's no such person as Joseph. So if the story is reworked, you can combine two different dynasties. You can combine this Pharaoh with this Pharaoh. And you can put them together and make one Pharaoh. God promised them the land of milk and honey. You can start working this into your historical record. They're manipulating their history. When in actuality, the Hyksos were invaders and they held the land for as long as they could. And then almost our ancestors gained their land back. That's not the way the story of the Bible is written. That's what history tells us. When Joseph rose to greatness as per the biblical account, what Hebrews should know, and this is where knowing history is important, Egyptians were not on the throne when Joseph was ruling. Native Egyptians were not ruling Egypt during that time. And that's where the biblical narrative opens in Exodus 1, and it speaks about a new king that arose over Egypt that knew not Joseph. They're speaking about Amos the first of the 18th dynasty, the first ruler of the 18th dynasty. He gets on the throne and he tears up the Hek, Chasut, the Hyksos, and he sends them running back to Palestine. And the remaining Amon, the remaining Semitic tribes are now property of Kemet. They're now slaves. You want to talk about when Joseph came into Kemet. What you're doing is you're combining actual fact with fairy tale. You're, you're combining them together trying to justify a fairy tale. That's already problematic. When the letter J hadn't been invented. Dude named Joseph just walking around in Kemet? Is that a manipulation of the situation? Calling this dude Joseph in Kemet. That's telling you off top that this whole story has been manipulated, has been tweaked, it has been revised. That tells you, you know it's been revised. There's no way around it. You know it's been revised. What does the Bible say about the Hyksos? Show me a verse in the Bible. Are you just piecing things together to justify your belief system? Is that what's happening? Or was there a dude named Joseph walking around in Kimmy and the word Hyksos is in the Bible? Is that what you're telling me? They just reworked the committed teaching. And these stories, these stories were written not by the victors. These stories were written by people who were expelled from Kemet. And yes, there were a lot of people expelled from Kemet one time or another. These people known as the Apiru are making mud bricks in Egypt. But I can also tell you who was the Pharaoh that commissioned it. The Nisut whose name is Men Kepera is none other than most the third I'm telling you who the Pharaoh of the Exodus is the same guy commissioning that mud brick structures be built in ancient Kemet is the same guy that's getting all this slave labor from Asiatic territories the land of Canaan Syria he crosses the Euphrates River enters Mesopotamia and brings slaves in the hundreds of thousands. And he brings them back to Egypt, all in the name of making Egypt great again. The people who worked the wine press as slaves in ancient Kemet, their name is Apiru. A-P-I-R-U. Otherwise known and pronounced by the Canaanites as Habiru otherwise known and pronounced today and known today to the world as the Hebrews. So you're saying that Apuru B 
becomes the Hebrews because the words sound the same, right? It phonetically sounds similar. I'm saying that Moses was Amos, Amosis. I'm saying that Amosis is Moses. Prove me wrong. I'm saying that the Bible was reworked. The name Moses and the character Moses in the Bible is based on a true historical person by the name of Amosis. This is again from the 18th dynasty, from the tomb of Naket at Thebes, Habiru or Apiru, straining out wine. They were also stone mason, masons. They were also building structures in Egypt, just like the Bible told you. The Apiru are being used in Egypt, the Hebrews, as quarrymen and manual laborers. Such tasks were typically reserved for the slave population of Egypt. And the biblical narrative of the type of slave labor performed is consistent with ancient Kemet or Egypt's historical record. And that's the most important thing to note here. Not that long ago, wasn't that you teaching your followers that the Shasu were the proto-Hebrews, but now it's not the Shasu, now it's the Aparu, right? That's what you're saying now? I'm gonna find that post where you were saying the Shasu not that long ago was the Hebrews. Let's speak about the truth of the matter. The truth is the Bible is not historical. They twisted and combined the Shasu, the Haparu, and the Hyksos as one people. They took the Hyksos exodus and the status of the Aparu. Were the Shasu the Hebrews or was the Aparu the Hebrews? Or were the Hyksos the Hebrews? The Hyksos had the conquering status. The Aparu had, was the underclass. So you can't really combine those two and say that they're the same people. So how do you got the Aparu being the Hebrews, the proto-Hebrews, but then you have the Exodus involving the Hyksos? The Aparu were real people. Yes, the Aparu were real people. Yes, the Hyksos were real people, but the biblical narrative has nothing to do with it. That's hundreds of years after the Hyksos were ejected out of Kemet before those stories were written in the Bible. Those stories were just folklore at that point. What happened was they were telling the stories for hundreds of years about the Hyksos, about the Shasu, about the Haparu. They were telling these stories and then they wrote it into the Bible, teaching about these primary sources about actual events. We don't have a problem with you teaching the actual historical history. But then to try to say that it has something to do with the Bible, when the Bible does not correlate with the actual history, where they do that at? The Ipua Papyrus, officially called Papyrus Leiden because it's in the Leiden Museum of Antiquities in Netherlands, is an ancient Egyptian hieratic papyrus that's made during the 19th dynasty of Egypt. So how come they don't tell you that? What they tell you that, uh, uh, scholars believe that although it was written in the 19th dynasty, that the accounts is, is recording something that happened much earlier in the 12th dynasty. Well, what we know is that it was written in the 19th dynasty. You know, the dynasty that comes after the 18th dynasty. The Ipua Papyrus is consistent with as an Egyptian account and parallel of the biblical narrative. They both speak of blood supernaturally turning the water red. They both speak of men thirsting for water. Fire coming down in the gates of the city. Barley perishing. The cattle in the field being smitten. Men are few, and he who places his brother in the land is everywhere. The children of princes are dashed against the walls. You got really, really loud talking about the Apua palate. Really, really loud, like you were saying something that was smooth, or saying something that was intelligent. What you said was nonsense. You're saying that the scholars were saying that the events that were written on this happened before it was written. Are you saying it should have happened after it was written? It happened in history. 
just like the Bible. In the Bible, those events are said to have occurred hundreds of years before it was written about. But now all of a sudden you don't understand that principle. You don't understand the concept that things happen, become written about later. You can't just be getting loud in your chest saying silliness. The Abuwa palette was written in the 19th dynasty. But if the events happened earlier, then again, I'm trying to tell you, years after these people were expelled from Kemet, they took their concept of their history and combined it with other people's histories. Stuff that happened in the 12th dynasties, stuff that happened in the 18th dynasty are written together as if it happened at the same time. They changed it up to the effect that things that happened in the 12th dynasty are now supposed to be occurring in the 18th dynasty or the 19th dynasty. They're smashing these historical events together. You're proving the fact that the biblical narrative is incorrect. That's what you're doing. You're saying it loud with your chest so people don't understand, so people will agree with you, so you can get the suckers involved. Be like, oh, he said that so loudly, it must be true. No, that's how the Bible was written. You gotta remember, the events that occurred in the Bible wasn't written about, written down until hundreds of years later. But you don't understand that. Get loud all you want. The truth is the truth. You're betting on the wrong horse. Reading these accounts together with Manisto's story of the war against Osiriseph, the person that Manito says is Moses, offers us a possible historical context for what eventually became the Bible's story of the exodus of Israel from Egypt. The combined historical narratives in Egypt make the argument for a historical exodus. Did you just say the combined historical events in Egypt Basically, when you combine these events, like I've been telling you, that they're combining these events, makes the historical argument for the biblical narrative for the Exodus? That's exactly what I'm telling you. If that wasn't a fact, I wouldn't be making this video right now. So up until this point, the Egyptian history is just talking about the Habibu, the Hebrews. But anybody who knows the Bible also knows that we go by another name, Israel. And that's on the Moneptah Stella. These are tablets from vassal kings of Syria and Palestine to Pharaoh Amenhotep III and Akhenaten. You know, the Armada period. You know, the period after the Exodus. And they're appealing for military help because they're saying to the Pharaoh, the Habiru, the Apiru, invaders. What did I tell you? During the time of the judges? Joshua are coming into the land. And what did they say? The hobby will plunder all lands of the king. If archers are here this year, then the lands of the king, the Lord will remain. But if the archers are not here, then the lands of the king, my Lord, are lost. Canaanites are begging the Pharaoh, Pharaoh Akhenaten, and the middle chapter third to send soldiers because the Hebrews are tearing up Canaan land and taking the land as their own. So the Armada letters confirm that Joshua coming into Canaan land is taking it city by city, which is consistent with the historical record because the Armada letters reveal that this in fact happened. A people known as the Habiru, the Hebrews, did in fact come into Canaan land and take land after land after land after land. Armada tablet EA290 from Abdi Heba, a name consistent with Phoenician Hebrew, mayor of Jerusalem to the king Pharaoh. A town near Jerusalem has deserted. Without archers, all the king's land will be lost. To who? The Habiru. The conquest of Joshua, the Hebrews coming into Canaan, is evidenced by the Armana tablets in ancient Kemet that testify to the consistent biblical narrative once again that everything the Bible was saying is absolutely true. You just said everything in the Bible is absolutely true because you have found some historical events that mirror the events in the Bible. 
It's as if you don't understand that the Bible is a rework of comedic history. That is what we've been telling you from the beginning. The Bible did not originally come out as a fictional book. It came out as something that was supposed to be a matter of fact. If the historicity in the Bible is thought to be matter of fact, then it's going to have facts in it. But the actual narrative meaning in the Bible of this external God who judges you, who took the Hebrews out of bondage, none of that is fact. None of that is fact. There were many exoduses out of Egypt. As a matter of fact, you likely learned that fact the same way I learned that fact through our teacher, Jabari Ozazi. You want Jabari to look silly, even though this is where you're getting your information from? I'll give you credit, definitely give you credit for learning the Medunetta. You're simply betting on the wrong horse. Come over to the truth. Go ahead, get rid of all those fictional fairy tales, magic, throw those out. They're done. And just come over to the truth. You're not trying to tear down the actual truth. You're trying to use the truth to support a belief. Unfortunately, the truth does not support your belief. Nowhere in there are you gonna see a literal Jesus Christ character. Jesus is a mythological character based on Haru. The literal Mary is a mythological character based on Aset. And you know this, man. You know the three-day death and resurrection is of the Son. You already know the story of the winter solstice. You know we've been telling this story throughout history. You know why the resurrection is on December 25th. You know this already. You know it's mythology. You know the facts of history. But you're still trying to justify something that simply can't be justified. Come on, man. Where they do that at? The Bible says, when I was a child, I thought of a child. When I became of age, I gave up childish ways. It's that time. You're a very intelligent brother, but it's time for you to get with the program. You're learning, Kemet. Good shot. Shout out to Zion Rex on that one. You're learning from the elders. Good shot. Some things might be historical. You want to believe in talking donkeys? You want to believe in unicorns and people walking on water? You want to believe it? Why? Come on, man. You're intelligent. You're too smart for this. You're smart enough to know better. And you should be smart enough to know not to put Jabari's name in your mouth unless you're doing it with all due respect and homage and admiration. Phoenix is the fifth largest city in the country, but it actually has more police shootings than New York, than LA, than Houston or Chicago. The city had the most officer-involved shootings in the country. 2018 was the most violent year on record for Phoenix police with 44 police shootings. This is an epidemic of police violence and we have to speak to it. New York City Police Department, the largest in the nation, had just 17 officer-involved shootings last year. Has any other city experienced 44? Trust me, no. That's how rampant this is. The Phoenix Police Department has a history of aggression. The National Report also points to an increase in use of force incidents with no guns involved. It should be clear that they are wielding their power with reckless abandon. This must stop. Dion Humphrey, he was shot in the chest with a rubber bullet by Phoenix Police. You only have partial functionality in as far as this Police say an ATF agent mistakenly identified him. And it was learned that he was not in fact Khalil, but he was Dion. So they immediately realized that Dion was not the person that they were looking for. Nevertheless, Dion was taken down to Phoenix Police Headquarters where he was interviewed. But they decided to hold him for hours when he was in need of the medical attention. On an unrelated investigation. There's so many holes in what officials and what the police are telling us. They used a flashbang, and when Dion started running, they hit him with a rubber bullet. These tactics show the disregard for our people. We can't allow them to continue to do this. They were just trying to inflict pain. Once again, this speaks to the disrespect and disregard that they have for our lives. We must hold the police accountable. It is critically important for everyone who is watching this program. Assist us in getting the word out about what happened. People worldwide are asking for justice for Dion Humphrey. Know that we must stand. Get the story out. You 
are part of this struggle. You are part of the fight. You are going to be a tool and element of justice. Talk about this case. Share this video. You had better be sure that the Humphrey family is not giving up.